All right. Thank you very much for the invitation. And uh, I'm being uh, ironic, actually, because I had this period I, uh, I have a lot of things to do and uh, traveling. And um, you know, this, uh, this allows me to, to think a little bit uh, about how to explain things properly, which I think you can only explain things properly if you really understand things. So I will not be able to explain things properly. So the, uh, what I want to give to you today is uh, it's an introduction uh, to uh, um, what, is, what it means to, to do a computation, OK? And uh, in particular, what it means to do a quantum computation, a computation using uh, quantum effects. So I will start from the, from the beginning, of course. Uh, the beginning being the, uh, the definition of uh, an automata. Okay. So this is classical theory of computation, um, computer science, which uh, is, um, is a very fascinating subject, I have to say. I, even though it's very formal, I mean, for a physicist, it's a little bit orthogonal to, what, to the, the way of thinking that, that we have been uh, has been given to us uh, while we were growing up uh, in college. And, um, but it's very useful because, you know, it, more than probably, you know, even other more, uh, you know, concrete branches of mathematics allows you to, to really think about the logic behind the, the, the whole thing. And so why, why did I get interested in this uh, theory of computation? Uh, well, I mean, there are several, there are several questions, there are several reasons for that. Of course, coming from physics, uh, it was very appealing to me, the practical implications. Okay, practical implications of understanding whether something is computable or not is essentially uh, uh, how difficult it is to, com to, 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 to make a computation is... Uh, uh, it, it tells you a lot about the physics of the problem. So for example, when we do Mont Monte Carlo simulations in physics, there are some problems which are inherently easier than others. Okay, you write the same uh, algorithm, same Monte Carlo code, you run it on a ferromagnet, and it runs like, you know, smooth, and you get numbers out, you can do finite scaling, so on and so forth. Then you take the same code, you run it to find, uh, you know, the properties, thermodynamic properties of uh, spin glasses, and the same code stumbles. Okay. And you ask yourself, why is that? Is there a deep reason for this to be true? It's, it's just uh, by chance. Can I write a better code? Can I ever hope to write a code that works for spin glasses as well as my five line codes of Monte Carlo works for ferromagnets. And when, when you start thinking deeply about these kind of questions, you end up thinking about computer science. And you realize that there is a lot about computer science that is about physics, and not only mathematics. It's really what's going on in a physical object. And the same thing if you try to, to do, you know, you want to understand um, the physical properties of a quantum system then forget about the Monte Carlo code. Okay. Sometimes we can write a quantum Monte Carlo code. Um, for some problems, you cannot even write a quantum Monte Carlo code. And, and you ask yourself, how does nature solve this? Right? Uh, uh, is, is there inherently something more powerful in quantum mechanics than there is in, in, in classical computers? Okay. Can we use this? And, and another motivation that, that led me to, to, to work on this thing is that um, is that sometimes when you, when you try to understand what you can do with the physical systems, this brings importance to the system itself. Okay? For example, topological uh, quantum memories brought a lot of attention to topology in uh, to, 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 to implications of topology for condensed matter, for example. And this is uh, an interesting topic. I mean, the Nobel Prize was given 
uh, two years ago about this. So thinking deeply about this question, I mean, th these questions are, are questions about nature. They're not questions about our, how our brain works. But that's also a question about nature. But you know, these are really questions about things which happen in real objects. So it's as much a question about physics as it is about math. OK, so much for an introduction. I think I, I spent enough. So what? So first of all, so what does it mean? We are not going to go through all of this. No. <laughs> <laughs> These are my, my notes for the class that I was uh, teaching in CISA until last year, actually, uh, about uh, quantum computation. So I'm only taking some. Um, but if you want, I can give you, if you are interested, we can, I can give you <laughs> notes to read and things to do. Uh, and so uh, since the audience is very broad, although I targeted this a little bit towards mat mathematicians, uh, if, you, if you have questions uh, in general, I mean, about what I'm saying, you can just. So the first thing I want to, to do is to give you a precise idea of what it means to do a computation. Okay, and the simplest computation is that which answers either yes or no. Okay, so you're given a problem, here you ask the whether this problem has a yes or no answer. There are computational models. Computational models become, sometimes are, are simple and they, they become more complex until we reach to what we think is the more universal computational model that we have that is the Turing machine. Okay? But the simple computational model that, that you should have in mind is, for example, it's called the finite automaton. Okay? So we have the, in the finite automaton we have a set of states We have an alphabet. I usually, this is just a Boolean alphabet. Um, and we have a transition function, a function which, take, which takes a letter in an alphabet, the state the automaton is, and then makes the automaton go to another state. OK? The idea is that uh, there is a register. I read the register 0, 1, depending on zero, uh, whether I read 0 or 1. And depending on the state which the automaton is, I do something else. Okay. And then there are some special states. There is an sta initial state, Q0. Okay. And there are some, there is a subset of states but you can even think of one of them, which are called accepted states. OK. So if at the end of the computation, my automaton is one of the accepted states, my, my string is accepted. It, it's said to be part of the language of the automaton. OK. All right. So. Um, let me give you a quick example. For example, the machine M2 is made of two states, the Boolean alphabet, the transition function that I will now specify, Q0 is equal to Q1. And the set of final state is just Q2. Okay. Now, the transition function delta, depending on what it reads and depending on the state, you are goes to OK. All right, 
So if now, now you have the machine, and I have to run it on a string. So for example, let's run it on the string x, which is 1101. OK. So what, what do I do? So this is the idea. So I read 1, OK, and I go, I read 1, and I go to Q2. I read 1, and I go to Q2. It depends on where, where I was, right? <laughs> so I read 1, and then I go to Q2. I read 1, and I go to Q2. I read 0, and I go to Q1. I read 1, and I go to Q2. The computation ends, and I finish in Q2. Q2 is an accepted state, so my string is accepted. OK, so x is in L of M2. OK? This is the idea of what the computation is for uh, an automata. All right. So, um, Sorry. yes? Q1 and Q0 is part of the definition of the automata. Yes. Yes. Okay. The initial state is, in, in this case, it's not important because it does always the same. In general, it is. Okay. So this machine, what does this machine do? Well, it's simply, I mean, it's, the, the, look at this. I mean, it's simple. If the last digit is, is 1, it's going to be accepted, the string. Otherwise, no. So the language L of M2 is the language of all the bit strings which end with 1. This is a particularly stupid example. So we can make uh, more complicated examples. Okay. So language is, is, a is a subset, is a set of bit strings. Is a subset of the, of the set of all strings, if you want. OK. And uh, a language is uh, called regular if there is, there is a finite automaton which, uh, which uh, uh, decides it. OK. So, the language of bit strings which end with one is a regular lang language. This is a useful definition because it does not encompass all of the languages, which means that not all the things that we, we, we think we can do with, that, with algorithms are just finite automata. OK, so this actually, uh, there, is some, there is something interesting. So, this, is, this was just to give you an idea of what, of, of what, the, computation, uh, of what the computation is, uh, what, what uh, doing a computation means. There are more <laughs> complicated models of computation. One of these is particularly important. It's called a push-down automaton. It's called PDA. These are called FA, finite automaton. PDA is exactly the same thing except that, in addition, it has an extra memory on which it can push bits and extract just the last bit. Push and extract, push and extract, push and extract. So which languages can be decided by pushdown automata? Clearly, all the regular languages plus more. And these more are called context-free languages. And these are important. They were invented by Noam Chomsky. And they're important because human language is a context-free language. So studying uh, uh, context-free uh, languages allows you to parse. Uh, I mean, it's when you have a, a sentence and you're, you, you want to parse a sentence, say, OK, this is the verb, this is the subject, this is the object. Uh, um, you know, the object can be itself a sentence. I like uh, doing this seminar. OK, so, <laughs> so the object is itself a sense. So, so um, PDA decide context-free context -free languages. And these are very, very important in linguistics. And it's the reason why Noam Chomsky is, I think, the second most quoted or cited author in the world. Um, this generated a lot of. 
He's not only a political activist, he was actually a very, very good linguist from you know, studying these things. OK, so, so uh, by the way, finite automata, like when you go to the, when you go to the supermarket and there are, the, the, you know, there are sliding doors, what's deciding, what's deciding whether it has to open the door or not? Uh, there is not just a simple side. There is a little circuit that because you want to open the door, but if you're on the other side, it has to close. So there is th that can be done with a finite automaton. You don't need uh, the full power of a, of a Turing machine to decide whether to open the door. You are entering or you are exiting. OK, so. Sorry, but finite refers both to the set of states and to the alphabet. No, the set of state will always be finite. The, uh, the alphabet will always be finite. And in fact, the most general alphabet you can, you can choose uh, is the, the Boolean alphabet. Okay? The, you can reduce everything, which is, you know, if you have three states, is, you don't, cannot decide more languages than if you have two states. It's finite in the sense that it doesn't have a, it doesn't have a memory. Turing machine is something which is infinite. And now, now I'll tell you, it's, it's, the, it's the memory of the Turing machine is infinite. OK. So how do you push down things in? Hmm? What do you do with this register? When do you choose to read something from the register? When do you choose to put it in? Oh, okay. With the PDA, there is, an extra, uh, there is an extra set here, which is the register. And the transition function has an extra slot. That tells if you read this, uh, you are in this state, then write this on the register. Pre that's predetermined. <coughs> that's predetermined. Everything is predetermined. This is an algorithm. Okay? You give the algorithm before giving the input. That's the idea. You give the, alg the algorithm is something, you put the input, and you see how the, the algorithm runs on the input. It's like what I said before I write my Monte Carlo routine. I run it on a, on a ferromagnet, and I find uh, the critical exponents, I mean, for physicists, the critical exponents to three digits. Great. The same algorithm, I put as an input the Hamiltonian of a spin glass. It doesn't converge. Okay? It takes forever to converge. Why? Okay. All right. <laughs> Now, let's look at another model of computation, which is the Turing machine. OK, so we have the alphabet. Well, here there is a slight distinction, because there are some, there, I there is one set that we want, that we want to be only part of the so there is an alphabet, and there is an external alphabet. Okay. Why is this? Because we want a blank symbol. The blank symbol is an element of the alphabet. Oh, S, sigma. Okay, let's call it S. The blank symbol is, the element, uh, is an element of the alphabet, but we don't want the input to contain the, the blank symbol. It's a technical uh, requirement. So for example, the, al the external alphabet A can be the, the Boolean, it's 0, 1. <coughs> OK. Within the set of states, there are two states now, which are called halting states. Q accept and Q reject are elements of the set of states Q. And the transition function, it's more complicated. Okay? Goes from the set of, of uh, the, the alphabet. The set of states tends to the alphabet in set of states alphabet and then one of these things mi z minus 1 0 plus 1 
What does it mean? I'll tell you in a second. And then there is a tape. The tape is a function from n to the set of states, meaning that I have a tape. Really, you have to think about the tape. Infinite. OK? Your machine has a pointer which points to a position on this tape. And as an internal state. Okay. Depending on the internal state and what it reads here, it, it changes the internal state, moves left, right, or stays put, and then writes something else. So the difference with the automaton is that the Turing machine can actually write on the tape. Now, Turing was, so T Turing did this work before actually the, the computers were built. So what did he have in mind? He had in mind a person doing a calculation. But not doing a um, calculation which requires a lot of imagination. So for example, in the 30s, in, in the 20s, in the 30s, People needed to do integrals, like we do now. Now we go on a computer and we write integrate open square bracket and, or n integrate open square bracket eh, and we get a number. Back then, they had a function, okay, and there were center. Uh, there were, they were you know small sections of the departments of physics and math in which you you would go and say, look, I need this integral, and the person in charge will take it, say, okay. Come back on Saturday, OK? And so you, you go home, and in the meanwhile, the person says, OK, now let's see. Uh, what do I do? So let's do, you know, the, let's use this algorithm to do this integral. Or, uh, you know, let's uh, do this other algorithm, so bisection, stuff. Eh? And wrote that, followed an algorithm, wrote down number by number, summed all the numbers, and got an answer. The, 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 the professor will come uh, after three days, get the number. And um, OK, so, so what Turing had in mind was this p person which was doing the calculation. He has a notebook, he or she has a notebook, okay, and writes the notebook, can erase on the notebook, depending on what's written on the notebook, uh, can decide to flip page back or front to stay on the same page. And there is an internal state in his brain, uh, his or her brain, that says, OK, if I read this symbol, do this. Okay. Uh, good. So, so what's the difference with the PDA that the tape is That the tape can be changed. But the PDA can also be oh, the, No, but only at the last point. Only one. Okay. The yes. Yeah. OK, so. So this is the definition of the Turing machine. So you have to imagine this thing that moves, takes a register, and writes on the register, and so on and so forth. So what can such a Turing machine do? I mean, it, it, I'm not asking which languages can it uh, decide. But what are the possibilities? So the possibilities are two, essentially. Either machine stops because during uh, the computation, at a certain point, it enters one of the halting states. Or, never, oh, oh, this is I didn't tell you, sorry. If at any point in the computation, the Turing machine enters one of these states, it exits the computation. The states are uh, in the definition of the Turing machine. The Turing machine is the algorithm. <coughs> so this is 
this is maybe difficult to, to, to digest a little bit. And in fact, it's called the Church Turing Thesis. The Church Turing Thesis is every algorithm is a Turing machine. Now, this is somehow the definition of algorithm, if you want. Right? Because when I, I talk to you and you know, I say, oh, I have an algorithm to find uh, you know, the hundredth digit of pi, and I tell you the algorithm. If I g tell you I have an algorithm to, you know, uh, to do something very strange, okay. find an arbitrary digit of pi, and this, this will uh, you know, run uh, in, you know, in two steps. You start thinking, well, actually, this is not really an algorithm, right? It's not, it's not what they have in mind as a notion of algorithm. An algorithm is a, a certain sequence of steps. You can go back. You can, go, you know, you can do this thing. You can change your internal memory. So, so the Turing machine is the best way we came up so far to systematize our concept of algorithm. And also, this doesn't change in quantum mechanics, by the way. Turing machines also play an important role in quantum, in, quantum, uh, in uh, our quantum system. Hmm? I have a half an hour. Yes, yes, yes. And I'm still at the beginning. OK, now, um, good. So uh, uh, Turing machine loops if it never enters, during the computation, the one of the halting states. Okay? If a, a language is decided by a Turing machine, if for every string in the language, the Turing machine will stop. It's guaranteed to stop on every string of the language. So decidable languages. can be written as the union of yes and no answers, which do not overlap. And if x is in a yes, then I feed it into the Turing machine. And at a certain point, it will I'm guaranteed that it will enter, the Turing machine will enter an halting state, accept. If I pick a string in a no, the Turing machine is guaranteed to stop and in reject. Are all languages decidable? The answer is no. Okay. There are so are all tasks algorithmic? No. If I say it like that, it, it sounds a, a bit more uh, more intuitive. For example, there, there are several uh, nice examples. The, 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 the example that is given always is the halting problem itself. Deciding, so deciding whether a Turing machine on a given input will stop or loop forever is not decidable. Halting is the problem in which a bit string consists of a bitwise description of a Turing machine and an input. And x in, is, will be in a yes if the Turing machine will stop on the input. x will be in a no if the Turing machine will loop forever on the input. This is a way to, to in, by the way, the way to show that this, this halting problem is not decidable is Cantor's diagonal argument which is the same thing that you use to prove that there are more real numbers than natural numbers. Okay? There are more languages than Turing machines. Because a language is a power set. A Turing machine is just a string. It's an algorithm, it's a string, right? It, it's on your hard drive. It's on your hard drive, it's just an integer number. Okay? But, uh, but there is something very interesting, actually. There is, a pro there is an alting problem which I like a lot, and it's Hilbert's tenth problem. 
Hilberts. Hilbert's problem is the following. I give you a polynomial of a certain degree in two variables, x and y, and I ask you whether this polynomial has a root which is an integer. I mean, x and y are integers. OK? Is there an algorithm to solve for this problem? The answer came in the 60s by Davis uh, Putnam. Uh, Robinson and Matiasevich, which proved that this problem is not decidable. There is no algorithm that, given as input a polynomial with integer coefficients, okay, tells you whether there is, an in, there is a root which is an integer or not. This is very surprising, because if you say, ask the same question about polynomial in a single variable, the answer is yes. And even I can give you an algorithm. First of all, if you have a polynomial, by looking at the coefficient, you can tell where the roots, where all the roots are going to be. There is an interval, you know, by looking at the coefficient, comparing the, the coefficients of the largest power with the coefficient with the less power, you can say, I know that all, all the roots of this polynomial are going to be in this interval, x1 and x2. And then I test all the integers in this interval, and I see if the polynomial is 0 or not. So this is not only decidable, but it's also easy to decide. But now I go to two variables, and the problem suddenly doesn't have an algorithmic solution. From my point of view, this means that there is no way of bounding the region in which the roots of a polynomial of two variables are. This can be an unbounded region, because you can have things like x squared minus y squared. So there can be a big region, infinite region, and the algorithm test all the numbers in that region doesn't work, because it's not guaranteed to halt. OK. So there are some problems which are decidable, some problems which are not decidable. OK. Amongst the problems which are decidable, there are problems which are easy and problems which are not easy. And this brings me to, um, through, through, my, uh, through what, I was saying, uh, to what I was saying before um, about uh, trying to compute things for a spin glass, trying to compute things for, for a ferromagnet. Compute things, I mean compute correlation function of spins, compute um, whatever, the average energy, compute you know, more complicated things. And these, what, what, what simple and non-simple, if you want, if, if e easy to solve and difficult to solve, if you want to formalize this notion, you are led to define what are called complexity classes. Complexity classes are um, classes of languages. So given a language, if the strings which are in the language can be infinite, can be infinitely large, I mean, are unboundedly large, I shouldn't say infinitely large, then you can ask how difficult is it to, to solve a problem for a larger and larger string. And for example, if x as size n means meaning that you know this is a bit string with n bits, then how long assuming that the language is decidable, uh, how long does the, the Turing machine take to enter the accept or reject state? So if it takes something like um, a polynom polynomial time, some, some, so if the time, the number of steps that the machine takes to decide this problem grows like n squared, actually I should put this order n squared. I mean, it doesn't really have to be n squared. It can be 3 n squared. It's, it's the order. So this problem is called, it, it, it's said to be in polynomial 
in P. This language is in P. P is a class of languages. And all at the same, if there is some alpha such that the time that takes to solve the problem of the input size n is n to the alpha, then this language is in P. Are all languages in P? We don't know. <laughs> Most, uh, this is one of the million dollar prizes, right? If there is anything outside P. So what do we define? Uh, how do we define something beyond P? Well, the simplest definition is problems we, we, whose, whose, for which a purported solution can be checked in time polynomial, OK? So given an x, I, have a, I am presented with a certificate, which also has size, say, less than n. Okay. And I have a machine called a verifier, which takes x and c. And if x is in L, yes. And there exists a C such that this, this spits out 1. If x is in a no, then for every attempted solution, the machine gives no and runs in polynomial time. Okay. This is the, uh, the, the intuition that verifying a problem, verifying the solution of a problem is simpler than solving the problem itself. Sometimes, OK? Sometimes, maybe not. <laughs> okay, but in this case, if the class of problems that for which I can give you a solution, and you can verify whether the solution is correct, or whatever, uh, or whatever you give me, I'm going to verify that, that, that that, I mean, th this is going to give me no, then this class is called NP. And clearly, P is contained in NP, because if I can solve the problem in polynomial time, I just have to ignore the certificate. It's like when you go to somebody very good and tell him, oh, look, I have this result. These are my notes. And he takes your notes, but it's like this. this right? Yeah, your result is correct, without looking at your notes. It's uh, Onsager was supposed to do this. Uh, so, you know, when people say, oh, yeah, I have this result. He never published uh, much. So he said, oh, look, I have these results. These are my notes. Oh, don't give me your notes. Just tell me your result. What's the result? That? You say, yeah, that's correct. <laughs> so, so P is in NP. The N stands not for non-polynomial, but for non-deterministic polynomial. But I cannot, I mean, this would. This is the definition. So there is a million dollar question whether there is a problem in NP which is not in P, or vice versa, whether P is equal to NP. We still don't know this. We don't know if it is actually, with this definition, easier, strictly speaking, easier verifying problems than just solving them. We don't, and this is actually. Uh, in, there are, there are, NP is not the end of the story. There are bigger classes. Yeah. And there are problems which are uh, not even known if they are in NP. So either. If I'm not mistaken, I remember that there is a hierarchy of classes. There is a hierarchy. And we at least know that the innermost class is not equal to the outer. No, we don't know that. Because if you can collapse at any level, the uh, polynomial hierarchy will collapse. Probably a subclass of P. No, but yeah, yeah. I mean, logarithmic problem uh, can be solved by deterministic finite automata. But any problem in n square, I mean, there are problems in n cube which are not in n square. And these are very easy to, 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 to cook up. Halting. Halting in which you restrict your running time of your machine to time to the 2.5. This can be solved in time n cube, but not in time n square. 
because it could be solved in time n square means that it doesn't really matter the restriction of the, of the, of the running time of the machine, then you could solve the halting problem. So these classes, n2, n3, n4, are disjunct. They are disjunct. Okay? We know there are more, more problems in class n cubed than there are in class n square. Um, but whether there are more problems in np than p, we don't know. So for example, which problem is in np? Um, but for, there, there, is, there, there are, uh, let, me give you, let me give you an example, which is subset sum. OK, subset sum is the following. I have a set of integers a1, an, OK? And I want to know if there is a subset s prime contained in s such that when a sum, you know, when a sum over the ai contained in s prime and, and the target t, and I get a target value, OK? So these are a, a set of numbers. I don't know, like 1, 3, 4, 5, uh, 37, 43. And then I give you a target, 157. And I ask you, is there a subset of this? It's called subset sum. Is there a subset of S such that the, 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 that sums to this target value? This problem is very easy to check, right? Just give me the, the certificate, is just the, the, the set. And you know, I, can, I can verify in polynomial time summing all the numbers that you, you gave me actually. Thing. And also, it's impossible to fool me. Because if you give me, if, the, if there is no such subset, then you give me a purported subset. It's easy for me to check that the sum is not the target. Okay. But we don't know of any algorithm which solves this problem in time polynomial in n. We don't, we don't know. And we think there isn't. So subset sum is in NP. And probably, probably, is not in P. But is it NP complete? Yes, it's NP complete. That's why we think it's probably not in P. But so, so this actually is a very important. Uh, it's a very important notion. NP-complete problems are problems which, uh, for which if you have a polynomial algorithm to solve that problem, you can use that polynomial algorithm as a subroutine to solve all NP problems in polynomial time. So they are the most difficult problems. OK. It's very hot here. Okay, much better. Much better if I stay here. <laughs> <laughs> if I move, uh, it's all right. Now, good. What about quantum computing? Okay, since you have 15 minutes, what about quantum computing? A Turing machine can also be written as a circuit. A circuit is a set of gates. Okay? There are AND gates. There are NOT gates. You take a, uh, let's do this, NOT this, then NOT this, and then this and this together, AND. And then there is, you know, this and this one. They go into an R. And um, and then they both go into an end. I don't know, something like this. Okay. So you put a, you put a, you put an input, and you get an output. The output can be a bit, single bit, zero or one, or can be many bits. In that case, the circuit is doing a computation. These are circuits like the, the CPU is in our, uh, in our computer. They do computation. You put in uh, you know, 64 bits, you get 64 bits. Okay? 
Good. By the way, deciding whether a circuit on a given input is going to give you a yes or a no is an NP-complete problem. OK? This is called circuit SAT. Is there an input such that the circuit is going to give you 1? Or for every input, the circuit is going to give you 0? This is, this is a difficult problem, NP-complete problem. It's called circuit SAT. Now, good. So, No, 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 they're not. Uh, OK, so a circuit is, uh, is, a, is equivalent. So a circuit SAT is a decidable problem. So it's guaranteed your Turing machine, your algorithm is guaranteed to, to end. So it, it's not, you know, it, it, yeah. you see what I mean? Because otherwise, you have to have, because these are, the circuits are directed graphs. You can only go one way. And you always get closer to the end. So there is no possibility. So on, on, the on, on NP problems, you can write an, any NP problem for Turing machine as a circuit to decide whether this circuit will give you 1 or 0. These are very complicated problems. So for example, when they p people do the doing um, engineering of circuits uh, at uh, IBM, for example, they have to solve these kind of problems. Um, it, you know, to see whether some input can actually can actually make your computation unstable, because there are there are many levels of, of things that you want to check during the a real computation on a, on a real circuit, and these are the kind of problems that these people have to solve, um, which we know that they are. NP complete. OK, what is a quantum circuit? Now, what is quantum computation? So there is a way of introducing quantum computation, which is based on quantum Turing machines. But that's very old, and nobody uses it anymore. Because there is an equivalent definition of quantum computation, which in which you only use circuits with gates. And what is a quantum computation? Quantum computation is the following. It's a circuit. OK? It's a circuit in which you can have things like this. Two qubit gates, one qubit gates, controlled gates. There is a big, there is a difference uh, uh, apparently. So this is, you know, let's, this is gate u1, this is gate u2, this is gate u3. Then there is a gate u4 here. And the idea is that you take an input state. OK, which, is, which gives you a state, initial state psi 0, which is the product x1 tensor x2 tensor yada yada tensor xn. You apply a set of gates on psi 0, and you get the, the output. However, the output is a quantum state. We don't want a quantum state. We want a yes, no answer. So what do we do? We take one of these bits here, and we measure it. We measure, and we get either 0 or 1. And we get a probability to get 1, for example, and the probability 1 minus p to get 0. So the answer to your computation is with probability p 1, with probability 1 minus p 0. So uh, in the end, we are going to have a uh, um, thing here. So, so we measure, we take psi, 
and we measure the first bit, let's say. Okay, we measure, um, so the probability is the expectation value of a projector. So let's say, let's say the following, we have, let's take this operator, sigma z, okay, sigma z is uh, 1 for on the state uh, 0 and minus 1 on the state 1. Okay, and then I measure sigma z of the, of the bit 1. Okay, how is this related to this? Well, this is, you know, 1 minus p times 1 minus p uh, times minus 1. So I have to do this. So uh, when I measure, I get either 0 or 1. In a lab, I get either 0 or 1. I don't, I don't get half of 0. But if I do it many, many times, then I can estimate this probability p to get a 1. This, now, if, now what, what is the answer? The answer is 1 if you get 1 with a probability which is significantly larger than 1 half. Let's say two thirds. Zero, otherwise. This is how you do a quantum computation. It's, uh, it doesn't sound much, <laughs> I know. <laughs> it also doesn't sound all the, 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 the strange thing that people claim that uh, quantum computation can do. But one has, one has to go and look at the details. So a quantum algorithm is a set of gates. And the answer of my algorithm run on a given input is this probability p. You get one. OK? So the analog of the class p is the class bqp. Bounded error quantum polynomial. Okay. So, where is the length? The length of the algorithm is the number of uh, of gates that they have to apply. There are various measures, either the number of gates or the depth. The depth is the longest circuit that you can make here. So for example, the, the depth here would be, for example, 1, 2, 3, 4. Okay? Depth 4. These cases. So there are various measures uh, of the depth. Yes? Yeah. Of course it's probabilistic. Actually, I should say that I should I should have introduced BPP, which is the analog randomized class in, uh, in uh, classical computations, but I can't. So, so, so it, it, the, the issue is that there are probabilities in quantum mechanics. There is nothing you can do about it. Okay. So you're never going to have, if you define a class by, you know, an algorithm is going to give you 1 or 0, then there is no problem in this class. No languages in this class. But if the answer is, you know, that, it is, that you get one, so LES, you run your algorithm, and the probability, so the probability that the, um, you know, this, this thing here, um, that the first bit is up, is one, let's say. Uh, is larger or equal than two thirds, and the probability, and it, and it's in a no. If the probability of the first t bit being one is less than one third. I write the input as a quantum state, I run the quantum algorithm, and then I measure one bit. Excuse me? Yes. If you have a feature 
effective algorithms. So they have to draw things early and what happens? So um, since you have to guarantee that this is not an infinite loop, you simply have to envelop this. Oh, no, 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 that's not, uh, because, you know, at, at the output here, if you fit this into another quantum machine, which can be even the same machine, this is an entangled state. It's not of this form. So it, it's not that you can just, you know, it's not running two times on this input. You see what I mean? Yeah. It's not like, in a classical uh, machine, that will be the same, right? I can rerun the, the same algorithm many times, but here I would get something, something different. I run, I mean, this is a unitary. I run the unitary square. This is a unitary transformation. It's a product of unitary transformations. They conserve probability. And if I run it twice, I just by you square. So. But a circuit cannot have an infinite loop, cannot have a loop. It, it must be a directed graph. There must be a direction in which I'm going. So there, there must be no loops. Otherwise, I end up into the undecidable. OK. OK, good. So let me give you, OK, to, to finish, let me give you one example. Um, so, so yeah. Worse. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. It seems like we have done things worse, right? <laughs> We have uh, made things worse. However, clearly, P is contained in BQP. Okay, why? Because these these uh, things can just be classical gates. Now, the only thing that I have to do with this, usually the classical gates we are used to, to think about, they are um, uh, they don't conserve the number of bits, right? For example, hand and as two in and one out. This cannot be done in quantum mechanics because you cannot destroy qubits. I mean, you lose probability. So, but there is the, for every circuit like this, there is a circuit. There is, if you enlarge the space, there is an invertible circuit which does the same computation. Question: You always initialize your uh, computation with a product state. Yeah. Which works sometimes. No, you always initialize with the product state because uh, you want a string in a language. And there is a one-to-one -one correspondence only between string and product states. Because the Hilbert space is a continuum, is a vector space, right? And so, uh, so there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between bit, bit strings and bases <coughs> of this vector space. So, but I mean, if you don't like initializing like that, then you initialize, then apply whatever gates you want, and then you for, for example, one thing that that you can do, it's very useful in many algorithms, is you want to generate, let's suppose you want to generate the state psi, which is the completely uniform superposition of all the bit strings. How do we do? This seems like a crazy thing to do, right? It's completely uniform superposition. It's actually very easy. Because this can be written as the tensor product of this is actually a product state. If you, I mean, if you take this and you take the tensor, uh, sorry, to the n. If you take the tensor product n times of this, you get you get this. By the way, this is not true if you change your phase here. If you change the phase, you, this is typically not a product state anymore, and it's an entangled state. It's a very entangled state. So how do you do this? Well, you know, you just apply. This H is the Adamar gate. So you apply, the, so you, you initialize with zero state. You, you generate, the, uh, you apply the Adamar gates independently of every spin, and you get this. So this actually gives me an easy counterexample to when people claim, oh, well, 
quantum mechanics is doing is like doing calculations in parallel, no? You don't gain anything if you do calculations in parallel over two to the n input. Suppose we do this, okay? And suppose we want to find whether there is so let's take a, let's take a gate which computes a function. And my my and then you know spits out something, but the only th interesting thing for me, the outcome of the comp computation is the first bit. Suppose our question is, is there an input such that this function is equal to 1? Or for every input, this function will be equal to 0? Then you might think that if you run this thing here, so 0, 0, 0, Adamar, Adamar, you get complete superposition here. And then here, you're going to get complete superposition of results. Yeah, but they come with a weight 1 over 2 to the n. So if there is one state for which f will give me 1 and all the others will give me 0, when I go and measure, I have to do order 2 to the n measures in my lab to estimate whether this actually can, all, can, can be 1 for some x or not. But 2 to the n measures is exactly what you would do classically by throwing at random uh, bit strings into a function f and computing f of x. So if, if this is my problem, and this is an n bit string, and then I have to find whether this is true or not, then if I don't have any information about f of x, then I have to just run. So this is not the, the so it's not true that quantum computers do calculations in parallel. At, at, if the efficient quantum algorithms that we have, they always use interference. Here there's no interference. How can this, they always use interference. Okay, do I have uh, time to give uh, one short example? I think I have exhausted everybody. Let's, let's say five minutes, okay, no, no more, no more than that. Um, uh, what is Grover? Ah, there it is. Okay, so there are a couple of algorithms which are, we, uh, for which we, we know, I mean, for one, for this one that I'm going to show you, um, we actually know that there is no classical algorithm that can do better than this, okay? And the other one, uh, the other ones, for example, Shor's algorithm, we don't know if there is an algorithm which can do factoring in polynomial time in classical uh, setup, because factoring is not an NP-complete problem. Factoring is difficult, but it's not NP-complete by far. In fact, factoring, it's, it's both in NP and co-NP. Co-NP means that it's easy to verify also that there is no answer. But I don't have time to do this. OK, so, so let's, uh, let's assume that we have an oracle function, as I said, A, which takes an input Y and gives, um, <coughs> and gives 0, 1. Okay? Now I want to know this thing here. I want to know if there is an X such that a of x is equal to 1, and I want to find what this x is. So classically, if I don't know what the oracle does, that's why I call it oracle, uh, I have to call the oracle order 2 to the n times. Quantum mechanically, I have to call the oracle time t, which is order square root of 2 to the n. And uh, how does this magic works? <clears throat> Let me, so let's, if I have this function, let's build the unitary which does the following thing. It's minus y if y, if, if a of y is equal to 1, and it's y if a of y is equal to 0. <clears throat> this is a unitary. It's, it calls the oracle once. 
and they can write it. Suppose that there, by, by simplicity, let's assume that there is a y. Let's call it y0, such that a of y0 is equal to 1. And my, my quest is to find y0. OK, then u is going to be the identity minus 2 times the projector over y0. Now, this gives me, the Adamar gives me a complete superposition over all the states, which I called xi. And let's define the other unitary, which is 1 minus 2 times xi. xi. This is the reflection on, in the plane perpendicular to y0. This is the reflection on the plane perpendicular to xi. Now, if I compose them, I get a rotation from y0 to xi. Okay? So if I compose them, vu is a rotation, is a rotation of an angle phi um, where phi alpha is the angle where phi alf is the angle, the angle between y0 and xi. Now, in principle, this will be difficult. So, so if we knew this, this angle, I would be uh, you know, the, the doing this rotation is easy. And, but we know this angle because this is complete superposition over all the strings. So irrespective of what this string is, the angle is, one, is the arc sine of 1 over square root of n. Okay. And that's why, actually, we get that square root of n there. OK, anyway, so, so the idea then, so sine of phi alpha is equal to 1 over square root of 2 to the n, rotation of phi. So let me write it like this. is e to the i phi tau. And uh, I really have to finish. So if I now do vu to the, so, so phi, let's say then this means that phi is uh, 2 times divided by square root of 2 to the n. Now vu to the pi fourth times square root of 2 to the n is e to the i pi half tau which takes y0 and sends it to, uh, so it takes xi and sends it to y0, OK? So vu pi fourth square root of 2 to the n over xi is equal to y0 plus an error of 1 over square yeah. So this means that. If I take this, and now I do, I do what you said before. I have this u. I have this, which builds xi. Then I have u. And then I, I apply this thing, square root of 2 to the n times. I start with 0, 0, 0. And I'm guaranteed to exit with y0. OK? You don't know what y0 is, but you can call the oracle. You can call the oracle, right? So the oracle is a function which takes an input and says uh, 1 or 0. I don't know. I mean, somebody gave me this chip. I, I put it in my, in, my, uh, in my hardware, but I cannot look into the chip. If I can send coherent input into this chip, and this chip is quantum mechanically, I mean, preserved coherence, then what you get out? You can use it as a, as a subroutine of your thing. I mean, if the, the, the name of the game is, the, the, the difficulty of the algorithm is how many times you have to call the oracle. And typically, in, in, I mean, in classical, um, with classical computing, you have to call the oracle 2 to the n times. Here, you only need to call the oracle square root of 2 to the n times. This is called Grover's algorithm. And uh, I will stop here. Thanks, Antonello.
Uh, are there more questions or comments? How do you deal with um, the problem of storming the quantum wave function on the quantum C? OK, so there are two big problems in uh, quantum mechanics, the, the, in uh, quantum computing, practical problems. <laughs> the first is to keep coherence. And the second is to keep coherence. So, so the, the first is to keep coherence in a memory. Okay? And the second one is to make operations without destroying the coherence. So the whole enterprise here is to make that, I mean, it's a technolo if you want, it's a technological, uh, it's a technological um, uh, enterprise here. I mean, it's, we, we, we know that um, there's not, I mean, at the fundamental physics level, this should work. You should get these this things here. But building these objects is a nightmare. Because you want to, as, as you said, you want to keep coherence during the computation. But also, when you, do the comp when you do, we apply the gates, you, you don't want to, to destroy your, your wave function there. You don't want to make errors in your wave function or entangled with something which you don't control. So it's a technological problem. It's a big problem. It's the big problem. Yeah, so this is actually what I wanted to show this to you. Uh, so so uh, I can tell you this. So, so the current there are two current trends in technology. One is using uh, uh, ions in a trap. Okay, So you have ions in an optical trap. And you can engineer. I mean, this can be in superposition of states. That the important thing is whether you have something which can be in a superposition of state or not. So ions in a trap can be in a superposition of state. And then there are things you can do to manipulate this, which are equivalent to applying gates. And the second, and the second uh, technology, which is more uh, condensed matter uh, hard, uh, you know, it's um, superconducting qubits. Okay? You have superconducting islands. And there are various technologies you can do. Essentially, you can make a qubit with uh, so in these superconducting islands, you can, put, you can put some charge, which is a Cooper pair. It's made of two electrons. Okay. And these two electrons can be in a superposition of being there and not being there. Okay. So using this, this, these two states of, of a charge, we can build a, a superconducting qubit. Uh, we can be, build a qubit, and we can make operations on a single qubit. We can make operation two qubits. And what, that's all we need to do universal quantum computation. How many there are currently perfectly under control? 16 qubits. Okay. Now, 16 qubits seems laughable. But if you have to simulate a 16 qubit quantum system, you need typically to make a number of operations which scales like 2 to the 16 which is, what is it, 65,000, something like that, 65,000. Uh, what about the Bristol cone? OK. This is now there are the, these new claims about the, the Bristol cone is the chip that uh, Google is working on, which has 72 qubits. At the moment, they don't have, I was uh, Google last week, actually. At the, at they gave a presentation about uh, this, the hardware. They explained all the problems there are. And they claim that they will be able to do a computation on these 72 qubits by the end of the year that cannot be done on the largest classical computer on the earth. Okay. No. Hmm? Known. <laughs> Known compute. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, 2 to the 72 is really big. 2 to the 72 is. I don't, thi I don't think there is enough RAM on the planet Earth to store a wave function of 2 to the 72 qubits. So you have to store 2 to the 72 double precision numbers. Um, and uh, that's a lot. <laughs> so, so we have trouble simulating 2 to the 40 <coughs> on, 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 super com uh, on clusters. Uh, so, so how far are we? Uh, unclear. 
something will be done will be done with these 72 qubits that cannot be done on classical computer however in order to do everything that we want to do we have to go to orders of magnitudes more than qubits talking thousands millions okay if we do a million if we have a system with a million qubit then we can do error correction and we can do arbitrary precision quantum computation uh, which you know it's a, you know that, that's another story that's you know it's something if you can do that we can so i i mean my my idea was to actually give you it's, it's, i i don't i i think not many of you have, uh, have actually looked at what a Turing machine is before. So I, w I really wanted to, to start from, I think I have been too, um, uh, I've been too optimistic <laughs> about <laughs> the plan of this lecture by, I think, a, a factor of three at least. <laughs> because, because, I mean, but I really wanted to tell you what a, a Turing machine is uh, and, and, and make you think about quantum computing in terms of how can I do better than a Turing machine? Because you read things on the newspapers which make no sense. I mean, so they claim, you know, this, you know, it's fast. So you need to know what what is the. I mean, we are scientists, right? We need to know <laughs> to 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 f make a framework where to put the ideas. And the Turing machine is the framework to compare also quantum computation. Uh, yes. The D-wave? No, the British con no, British con is completely different. So uh, D-wave was a different technology. It was uh, the adiabatic uh, quantum computation, which is something that they haven't done. It's a different protocol. Uh, and it was not clear. How I mean, they had 10,000 10, qubits, qubits, right? Something 2,000 like 2, qubits. But I mean, they were not just not keeping coherence between more than seven or eight of them at the time, but still they were claiming uh, speed up. They are still claiming speed up with respect to some classical algorithm. The current architecture that IBM, uh, Intel, and Google are, uh, are using is completely different. They say, OK, we stop at 16, but we'll show you that we can keep coherence on the 16 for as long as the calculation is required. We go to 20, we'll show you that this will keep coherence for 20, these 20 qubits for as long as the computation. Then we go to 30, then we go to 40, then we go to 72 and show you that this is, will, uh, will keep coherence and quantum effects up to as long as the calculation is needed. It's not, uh, let's, you know, go to 1,000 and let's see what happens. Uh, that was useful. I mean, I have to say, I mean, being in the, in the, in the community, it, it was useful to, to get people interested some sense but nobody thought that it was real, really a quantum computer so it's speaking of the uh, fact uh, the d-wave uh, system what is the relation between the circuit model and like uh, quantum oh the, uh, there is a theorem uh, which is actually not even uh, that difficult uh, um, to prove that uh, um, adiabatic quantum computation is universal so it's equivalent to the circuit model whatever you can do with the circuit model you can turn into an adiabatic quantum computation and vice versa. And this is a constructive proof? Yeah, yeah, it's a constructive proof. Yes. So I can always take the circuit and yeah. then just. Yeah, and make it into an adiabatic quantum computation. Yes. However, the issue is that if you take a circuit which works on 10 qubits with the 20 gates, you make it into an adiabatic quantum computation of probably 100 qubits and 1,000 gates. The number, I mean, the, the parallel is that whatever I can do here, I can do here. But not whatever resources I use here, these are the same resources I use here. Sometimes you have to, and actually most of the time in this kind of proofs, you have to uh, allow for many, many more resources. Like what I said before, if you have irreversible computation, you can get the same results as reversible computation, but you have to enlarge your bit space. And it's the same there. I mean, it's quantum computation. Uh, the circuit model and the adiabatic com computation model are the same. They, they are equally powerful, but one requires more resources than the other. Okay, we can continue. Yes. Can you speak it again?